Axel Pebble. Thanks very much for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, and Danny has given a picture of what is developing in Spain. Now, Britain is not yet Spain, it's not yet Greece. We haven't seen struggles on the scale that are taking place in those countries. But even so, on the 26th of March this year, we saw the biggest trade union demonstration in British history. And if that demonstration was a show of strength by the working class, last Thursday, on the 30th of June, battle was engaged for the first time. And those 750,000 people who came out on strike, who took part in the strike action last Thursday, all walked away at least a head taller as a result. The leader of the most moderate trade union to take part in the strike action, the ATL, who haven't taken strike action in 127 years before last Thursday. She kind of summed it up when she spoke to the strike rally in London and she said, they thought we wouldn't do it. They thought we'd lie down and let them walk all over us, but they were wrong. And she was met with uproarious applause from the mainly young teachers who were in that hall and heard her speak. And there are countless examples, and I'm sure other people can give them, of how after the strike, people went back into the workplace and were more confident, not just on the issues of pensions, but in general, their confidence had been raised by the strike. I was told one example of the day before the strike of um, a Socialist Party member who's an NUT organiser in Newham. And she briefly <coughs> had a young teacher working in her school who then gone off to be a teacher in rural Suffolk where the NUT were not strong, were not well organised and in her school everyone was saying, oh we can't go on strike, what can we do and so on. And she got them all together, she said we can meet in our class, my classroom and we'll discuss coming out on strike. So they all met together, the head teacher walked in, said you're not allowed to use this classroom, what are you doing here, go away. And one person, not the young woman who called the meeting, but an ATL member, came in and said, what are you doing here? This is a trade union meeting. You've got no right to be in here. Get out. And the head teacher turned around and walked out the door. Now, that's just one little incident, but there's no question there were many, many incidents like that as a result of last Thursday's strike. All the government propaganda beforehand, the idea that the strikes weren't widely supported by the workers in those trade unions. I mean, it was always rubbish. How dare they? The Tory party got 24% of the popular vote in the last general election. The people who voted Liberal didn't vote for cuts by any stretch of the imagination, and yet they dare to criticise the turnout in the strike ballots. But it was answered by the day of the strike. The PCS, for example, there were about 70,000 people who voted in the strike ballot. There were 200,000 people who came out on strike. And as Mark Zavocca, the General Secretary of the PCS, said, what matters more, voting on a piece of paper or voting with your feet and walking out the door and coming out on strike? And in the aftermath of the strike, I think there are 2,000 more people who've joined the PCS. The NUT and the ATTL are growing. The NASUWT, the union that didn't take strike action, is shrinking fast as people... Because after all, what are you in a union for? You're in a union, so it'll stand up for you when you need it. And the membership of the unions that have taken strike action are increasing rapidly as a result of the strike. I think the other thing that has to be said about it is this was no duvet day strike. This was not a strike where people thought, oh, a chance for a bit of a rest, I'll stay at home today. I mean, there weren't picket lines universally. There were the civil service, it was more mixed with the teachers and the colleges. But the demonstrations were really big. I mean, that demo in London, 30 or 40,000, there were 40,000 <coughs> members of the NUT in Greater London. At least a third of those came and took part in the demonstration, given its size. But in a way, because in London we have demos, more significant than that were all the towns, even the villages, that had demonstrations and protests of workers, probably for the first time, I mean in some cases it might be the first time since the general strike of 1926, I mean really every little town and village had demonstrations as part of the strike. So there's no question.
question, as a result of it, the government is shaken, they're on the back foot, their propaganda on the issue of pensions they're losing. I'm sure most of you have listened to Francis Maud on the day of the strike on the radio where he just was made to look an idiot because the argument which they've been getting away with that the pensions were unaffordable when in, in reality the amount is going to go down that has to be paid towards the pensions, he couldn't answer it. And since then they've had to shift their propaganda to say it's being about being fair and so on because it was answered so devastatingly on uh, the question of the affordability of the pension schemes. And if you look at the opinion polls, a big majority in all opinion polls oppose what the government is doing on pensions. But also, despite all of the propaganda by the capitalist media, the Murdoch press and the rest of them, that this strike was outrageous, that it was disgusting, that some poor school student who was tragically killed when a branch fell on her head was somehow the fault of the evil striking teachers, all of the propaganda that's been on the front page of the tabloids, despite that, there was big support for the strike action. The worst opinion polls you see are split down the middle, with half the population supporting the strike and half the population opposing. But then if you look at public sector workers, at the Midlands, at the North, at women, at the working class, amongst all of those sections of society, it's a clear majority who supported the strike action that took place. So does that mean that last Thursday's strike is going to have been enough to defeat the government. <coughs> People on the strike day did keep saying to me, perhaps after today, the government will listen to us. It will make them listen. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, let's be clear about this. It's not a question of making the government listen. This is the government who claim that the private sector is going to make up for public sector jobs being slashed and yet are allowing that train company in Derby to go to the wall, thousands of jobs going down the road. This is the government who knew full well that their cuts in housing benefit, as has now been revealed with the secret memos of Eric Pickles, are going to lead to 40,000 families homeless on the streets of Britain. This is the government, if you look at the cuts in disability benefits, there's material in The Guardian today showing how that in Wales alone there are going to be there are 180,000 people currently on incapacity benefits and 31,000 of them are expected to end up not just thrown onto job seekers allowance but to end up with no benefits at all not a penny as a result of the government's review you've got to go back in Britain to 1931, the introduction of the means test, to a time when tens of thousands of workers were left without a single penny in benefits when they couldn't or weren't able to get work. By the way, that led to mass uprisings across the country when they tried to do it then. And the same will happen if they go ahead this time. But the idea that this government don't know that they're forcing public sector workers to work until they drop that they're leaving them in poverty with the cuts that are taking place in pensions. They know full well. It's not a question of making them listen. It's a question of building a movement powerful enough to force them to retreat. Was last Thursday enough to do that? The answer is no. Probably not on its own. It's going to take further action. But it is possible to defeat this government and to force it back. 2011 will go down as the year in history when not just in Britain, not just in Europe, but above all worldwide, the idea was smashed that we are powerless to do anything. Because that's what we've been told, isn't it? There is no alternative. Tina, you've got to lay down and accept whatever they throw at you and there's nothing you can do about it. But look at Egypt, look at Tunisia, <coughs> mass movements of the population, of the poor, above all of the working class, that were able to remove dictators back to the hilt by imperialism, that had been there for decades and were able to remove them in a matter of days. Now that doesn't mean, this is not a speech on the Middle East, I haven't got time to go into it, that doesn't mean that the working class and poor now have power in Egypt and Tunisia. Unfortunately that's not the case. 
and this discussion and a mood for the need for a second revolution, because it was a revolution that took place at the beginning of the year in those countries, in order that the working class and the poor can take power. But what is lacking, the reason that that hasn't happened so far, is a party, an organisation that can bring together the working class, the, attract the rural poor, the urban poor, and fight on a programme that is capable of changing society. That is lacking as yet, but nonetheless, the power of the working class and poor to change things has clearly been shown by the movements that have taken place in those countries. Or, as Danny has said, by what is taking place in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece. Greece are now, they've just had their 11th general strike. The idea that working class people in Greece are not prepared to fight, nobody could argue that they are facing the Troika, the IMF, the European Union, the European Central Bank. They are facing all the powers of world capitalism telling them they have got no choice but to accept what has been shoved down their throats. But it's so bad. I mean, it really is. You have to go back to the 1930s to see a drop in living standards in a European country in the way that it's now taking place in Greece. <coughs> Public sector workers are now going to have their wages cut by another third. Private sector workers' wages on average have gone down by 20%. This 20% unemployment, and after a year, the unemployed don't get a penny. People are living on church handouts, begging on the streets. It really is a return to the 30s or even to a kind of Dickensian era, era what is taking place in Greece. And it's such misery. No matter who's telling them they've got to accept it, the working class of Greece are saying no and are fighting back, despite the difficulties. Because you hear they've had 11 general strikes and you think, well, they must have a great trade union leadership in Greece, must be better than some of our trade union leaders here in Britain. But it's not so simple, actually. Most of the trade union leaders are linked to the equivalent of the Labour Party, PASOK, which is in government, and they don't want to carry out more general strikes. They're trying to hold the movement back, and when they call them, they do it as a way to let off steam rather than seriously to defeat the government. But despite that, the movement of the squares, taken up what developed in Spain, you could see how in Greece, blocked through the official trade unions, the movement in the squares took place, and out of that, the trade unions were forced to bring forward the general strike that took place on the 15th of June. That was a massive general strike. A quarter of a million in Athens demonstrating, plus in every town around Greece, this is in a population of 10 million, that put enormous pressure on the trade union leaders who then had to carry out a 48 hour general strike, the first in over 30 years that has taken place in Greece at this stage. So it's not over. The latest round of cuts have gone through, as I'll go on to comment on later on, but there is no question. The working class is standing up and fighting back across the world and workers in Britain are watching that and are inspired by it. I'd say it's also the other way around. I know we're not in the front line, we're a little way behind some other countries, but it's still true that workers in Greece, in Spain, in other countries are inspired by what's taking place in Britain, not least because we are a little bit behind. It's the idea they're starting to fight back in Britain, but they're not taking it there then that means they're fighting back everywhere. And the student movement last year had a big effect, but also the trade union demonstrations and strikes that have taken place since. And our experience in the strikes last Thursday was that while there might be a hope that the government would listen after the strike today, there was also a determination that if they didn't, everybody was prepared to strike again. I didn't meet anybody who doubted the idea, we will come out again in the autumn if that is what is required. Now, of course, the other issue, Mark Savocca got a standing ovation when he finished his speech by saying, next time, it can't just be 750,000, it's got mm. to be 4 million. Unite, Unison, <coughs> DMB, they've got to be out in the autumn as well. And again, our experience in the Socialist Party doing campaigning stalls this last Saturday is the biggest group of people who came and signed the petition, who supported us, who bought our paper, were members of Unison, saying we should have been out on that strike last Thursday as well over the question of pensions. And part of our role in the Socialist Party is to fight now 
to make sure those unions do come out, to exert the maximum pressure, resolutions through local branches. There's a Unison Executive meeting next Wednesday. A lobby by Unison members has been organised. We have to make that as big as possible next Wednesday. On the 11th of September, the Trade Union Congress is meeting just round the corner from here, at Congress House in London, and the Shop Stewards Network wants to organise a big demonstration to that, to demand that everybody is out in the autumn. And we have to give a little warning here. The government was put on the back foot. They were frightened by the strikes that took place last Thursday. And they seem to have finally worked out that the best way to defeat the movement might be to divide it. And they are looking at trying to make some kind of compromise with local government workers in order to give Prentice and the leadership of Unison a way out of coming out on strike next time. And we have to be clear, a victory is one thing, but a few puny concessions to split the movement, we're not accepting that. We have to fight for a united movement across the public sector, uh, public sector uh, in the autumn. So that's a critical part of what we've got to do. And we can win on the question of pensions. Just to give one example, even according to the government's figures, it would cost them £2.8 billion to concede on the attacks on pensions, to give in. In modern money, it cost the last Tory government £7 billion to scrap the poll tax. <laughs> Faced with a mass movement that was determined, led by the Socialist Party at that stage, the militant as we were then, <coughs> they had to retreat. And they can be forced to retreat on the question of pensions as well. But of course, pensions is just one part of the £81 billion worth of cuts that this government is planning to carry out. The biggest assault on the public sector that we've seen since 1931 and the attacks that took place then. And we have to fight them all. Industrially, strike action is part of how we do it. But if we're not going to fight with one hand tied behind our backs, we have to fight politically as well. Mary Boosted, the leader of the ATL, the moderate teachers' union, made one other very good point when she spoke at the rally last Thursday, because she was the only one who clearly attacked Miliband for condemning the strike action. And she said, I am proud that my union is not affiliated to the Labour Party. She said, it's disgusting what Miliband said. And then she went on to say, what has that pathetic excuse for an opposition, the shadow cabinet, ever done to defend the public sector? Sisters and brothers, we have to do it for ourselves. And we would have paid good money to have a Socialist Party speaker speaking on the platform after that. We had an excellent debate <coughs> for a Socialist Party member speaking on the issue of young people. But we'd have loved to have speak on the question of political representation. Because if someone had come in after Mary Booster and said, Mary's right, we have got to do it for ourselves. And all three main parties support the attack on pensions. Hutton, a Labour Lord, wrote the policy on pensions. We, as teachers, as civil servants, as young people, as the unemployed, we should be standing in the elections ourselves, putting forward a programme in defence of the trade unions. It would have got massive support at that rally. Now, unfortunately, at this stage, nobody put that idea forward. But there's no question, objectively, in terms of the potential for it, the idea that we've raised that what's needed is a workers' party in this country, that the trade union's a mass workers' party, that the trade union should stop funding the Labour Party and should begin to build their own party, there is more of a basis for that now than has ever been the case before. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be simple to bring it about. The civil servants union are going to have a ballot at some point this year over deciding to back or stand trade union candidates. And when that takes place, that can open the door to trade union candidates standing on a much bigger scale. But for many workers, it may still take more experience of struggle to go from thinking it's a good idea to actually making it happen. But there's no doubt that there is a door open in that direction. Of course, there are still some who think that we can change the Labour Party, that we can switch it back to the left. Most of those hoped that Miliband would be part of that switch back to the left. Socialist Party members had a discussion with Lenny McCluskey, the leader of Unite, who was good on some issues, but was saying, 
Bernie's better, Miliband's better than the others were. We're going to fight to transform the Labour Party. We're going to use Unite's power in the union to do it. This was four days before <coughs> Miliband went and condemned the strike and was then photographed in Parliament. I mean, how stupid can you get laughing over a cup of tea with Cameron and Craig while meanwhile the PCS picket lines were on Parliament's gates trying to stop people going in. We would say to those who want to fight to change the Labour Party, we don't judge that it's possible to succeed in doing that. And we don't judge it because to do it would require a mass influx of workers into the Labour Party to fight to change it. And that has not been the reaction of most working class people to Miliband's comments. If you read the letters pages of the Mirror or the Guardian, They've been full of letters. One summed it up where it said the Labour Party died on Thursday. Others saying, I joined the Labour Party after the general election and now I'm leaving again. It's time that we need, there was one that said it's time we need a new workers' party. So I put his name in our membership database because I thought, well, maybe he's a member of the Socialist Party I've never heard of. But it was nobody that we knew that had written in and said that. A convener of Unite in the West Midlands, Lenny McCluskey's union phoned up the Socialist Party in Coventry and said last Thursday, I've torn up my Labour Party membership card today, I'm joining the Socialist Party tomorrow. And that has been the main reaction. So that's why we don't think it's going to be viable to say to lots of workers, join the Labour Party and fight to change it. But also, if you were going to do that, you would have to completely rebuild the democratic structures of the Labour Party because they don't exist anymore. The trade unions no longer have power within the Labour Party. They can't even move motions at the conference anymore. <coughs> and the conference itself has absolutely no power. And Miliband wants to make it even worse. He wants to get rid of the few remnants that exist of workers' democracy within, uh, uh, with, uh, within the Labour Party. So we don't think that that's viable. However, we would say to the likes of Lenny McCluskey and others, better to have a serious fight to test your idea to fight for Labour to stand on a socialist programme, for it to stand against any cuts, for it to repeal the anti-trade union laws. Better to do that than what has gone on with the affiliated unions, where they've let the leadership get away with whatever they like. And if you succeed, we're not dogmatists. If we're proven wrong and you succeed, we'll be very pleased. But if not, you should draw the conclusions that it's necessary to build a new party of the working class. Now, we have to say, if you look at the strike that's taking place in Southampton at the moment, which is against a Tory party uh, council, unfortunately, the leadership of, the Un of Unite are not taking the approach that we would propose, because they are putting forward in a blanket way, what you've got to do is get Labour elected. <coughs> we would say, don't just say get Labour elected, demand that Labour sign in blood that they will reverse the ripping up of council workers' contracts that the Tory council are carrying out in, in Southampton, and then we'll consider voting for you. Because in every other <coughs> Labour council where they're in power around the country, they are carrying out, like in Waltham Forest, exactly the same kind of cuts in contracts that are taking place in Southampton under the Tories. So this question of building a new workers' party is going to be a big theme in the coming periods. And again, it's an international phenomenon. It's an important issue in Britain, but it's even more acute in some of the countries of Southern Europe. Greece, it's a PASOK government, the equivalent of the Labour Party. They've carried out cuts which are unimaginable in their barbarity. They make what the condemns are doing look quite mild. That's how bad what is being carried out is. All but one PASOK MP voted down the line for those cuts, and the one that didn't was immediately expelled from PASOK on the spot. That's not a party that stands up in the interests of working class people. Is it any wonder that 47% of people in Greece now <coughs> say that they won't vote for any of the existing parties, given what's on offer? Or in a similar situation, in Spain as well, in, in, in um, I'm thinking, I've lost my note, but in Portugal, 41% of the population abstained in the recent election. It's no wonder that the mood in the movement of the squares is, on the surface, against political parties. When every political party is doing that to you, well, and stands for doing that to you, for taking away your pension, for leaving you on the dole, for leaving, for cutting your benefits, 
you're going to be against all political parties. But it would be completely wrong, as Danny described, to conclude from that that in a real sense, it's an anti-political mood. Actually, it's an anti-capitalist politics mood. That's what exists. And when our members have intervened, as Danny has in Spain, but also our section of 500 members in Greece, and have put the position that the democracy of the squares movement needs to be spread, needs to be spread to the workplaces in particular, to workers' committees being set up in the workplaces, for the linking of those different committees together on a local, regional and national basis. In other words, for an organisation of the movement around a clear socialist programme, those demands, while they've not yet completely been taken up, get an enormous sympathetic support because it's an anti-capitalist mood and people are groping in the direction of how can we organise our movement. And that, in essence, is a discussion on how you build a mass political party, in one sense, but a party of the working class and the poor. There was an article in the Financial Times last weekend by some academic, and it was all about the demise of political parties. It was taking the Tory party bloke who died in the toilets at Glastonbury, his secret memo saying um, that the, no one wants to join the Tory party, all political parties are shrinking. And this bloke was basically agreeing with what the Tory Glastonbury chairperson had said. But he said it's inevitable that political parties will shrink to vanishing point. And he said the reason is because the differences between the main parties have narrowed almost to vanishing point. Few socialist parties exist any longer, and only the tiniest fringe parties taught the language of political study. And then this uh, uh, political struggle. And then this academic went on to say the reason for that is because in the past, politics was a matter of warfare between classes, nations, races, and religious denominations. But in Europe today, actually in brackets, he did say except in Greece. It's so obvious in Greece, even he couldn't ignore it. But he said, in Europe today, that is no longer the case. In other words, we have social peace. There's no reason for differences between the political parties. But of course, the reality is, there may be not a cigarette paper between the political parties, but there has never been a bigger gap between them and the majority of the population. And if you asked public sector workers in Britain today, or young people, or pensioners, do we live in an age of social peace? Is it no longer an age of class warfare? They would say no, because this government is conducting a brutal class warfare against us. And far from shrinking, what's the idea of a political party who stands for the majority, for ordinary people, for the working class, begins to take off? That would be a party that would grow like wildfire. We see the beginnings of it in Ireland, where we've been able to get members of parliament and an MEP elected. But you would see a similar situation to you saw in Britain when the Labour Party was first formed, back when at least at its base it was a workers' party, and the Liberal Party went from being the second big party to being marginalised as workers began to vote for their own party. And a similar process will take place in the future on the basis of the coming struggles. Now, what should such a party stand for? We're clear in the Socialist Party. If trade unionists in Britain decided to stand in elections and all their programme was, was no to the cuts in the public sector, get rid of the anti-trade union laws, and that was it, that would still be a huge step forward from what we've got at the moment. It would be an enormous advance. But nonetheless, we would argue that to be fully effective, a new workers' party over time would need to adapt, adopt a socialist programme. Because it's not some coincidence, as Danny referred to, that in Britain, in Ireland, in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, everywhere, the working class is facing the biggest attacks on its living conditions in 80 years. It's not that suddenly we've got a bunch of nastier politicians elected, although I know <coughs> when you've got Cameron as Prime Minister, it's easy perhaps to think that that is the reason that it's taking place. But the reason for it all is as a result of a profound crisis of capitalism, the most profound crisis of capitalism since the 1930s. When we tipped into crisis as a result of the catastrophe in the finance system in 2008, in 2008 alone, £50 trillion pounds worth of value was wiped out of the world economy. So that was jobs going, factories shutting, destroyed. 
In Britain now, when we're supposed to be supposed to be getting better again, according to Mervyn King, the economy is still 4% smaller than it was at the start of the economic crisis. We have not recovered. We have a catastrophic situation. In Merthyr Tidville, again, this is in The Guardian today, it's a place in South Wales, there are 84 people chasing every single job vacancy. I mean, when I was young, in the 1980s recession, there was a band called UB40 that had their first song that they was a hit, they got a bit crap later, but it was called, um, <laughs> uh, what's called We Are The One In Ten. We are the one in ten that's unemployed. But the way it's going, in part of Britain, it's already far worse than that. And the way it's going, then it's likely to be far worse than that across the board as the public sector crisis hits. Now, Mary Boosted also said when she spoke that public sector workers have been asked to pay for the £850 billion that was spent rescuing the financial system and the British banking system. And she's right. It's not just public sector workers. Everybody has been asked to pay for the nationalisation of the debts of the big financiers. The same financiers, who are now refusing to take a haircut even, as regards the Greek debt, will send the Greek population into absolute poverty rather than lose a penny themselves. But it's not even just about finance capitalism. It's not as simple as saying we could have a better capitalism that wasn't dominated by the big banks and the financiers, that was dominated by manufacturing industry and would be lovely and better and like the capitalism that we used to have. It would be more accurate to say that the collapse of the finance system and everything that led up to it was a symptom of the profound sickness of the capitalist system today as a whole. So it was a symptom and not the cause. You can go back to a brief period in history, at least in the economically advanced countries, between about 1950 and 1973, where capitalism grew so fast that we got a few crumbs from the table, we got a national health service, we got a welfare state. But since that period came to an end, capitalism has been attempting to take it back and to restore their profits by driving down the living conditions of the working class. And you don't have to look at socialism articles to see that. There was a survey done that was published in the Financial Times last week. It was actually done by part of the IMF. And in it, they talk about workers' wages. Not now, during the recession, but during the boom. And they say that in Britain, a forklift truck driver, they're just taking that as an example, they really mean any manual worker, is got, earns 5% less in real terms than they did in 1978. That in the United States, median male earnings have been static since 1975. In Germany, that wages have been falling for workers for the last 10 years. This is in the boom, not in the economic crisis, Workers' wages in real terms have been driven down. And meantime, the wages of the bosses, not their wages, but the wealth of the capitalists have been increasing on an astronomical level. This is Socialism Today, our monthly magazine. And there's a review this month of an article called, uh, uh, about a book called 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. It's not a book by a socialist, but it's a critique of capitalism. And in it he says, between the 1980s and the start of the recent recession, the compensation, that is salaries, benefits, stock options, etc., of CEOs rose from an average of 30 to 40 times that of an average worker to 300 or 400 times on average that of an average worker. So in other words, our wages stagnated or shrunk and they earned absolutely vast amounts of money. But they didn't invest that money in industry. They didn't invest it in industry because it wasn't profitable for them to do so. And why, in essence, wasn't it profitable? This is a bit of a simplification, <coughs> but it's really what Marx described 150 years ago. Working class people couldn't afford to buy back the goods that were being produced because their wages had been driven down. If you move manufacturing abroad to countries with cheaper labour, who's going to buy the cars? Because the people making the cars can't afford to buy them anymore, and neither can the US or British workers who are living on the dole or working in Tesco's as a result of being laid off from the car plants. So that was what took place over a whole period with capitalism worldwide. And where they didn't invest in industry, instead they gambled on the world stock markets. It was a huge casino. And that's what led to the financial catastrophe which began in 2008. And there's no prospect of it ending. We don't 
don't mean by that that capitalism is going to collapse. Unfortunately, capitalism never collapses. It always finds a way out over the bones and the living conditions of working class people and it will strive to do the same again. But there is not going to be growth on a healthy basis. This is a period of, at best, stagnation. But if you look at Britain, well, it's what's taking place in the Eurozone, where that's not going to last. There's going to be further crises there. Greece will default. Spain will probably have to default. The Eurozone itself will collapse, and all of that is going to knock on to Britain, because that's our biggest market. We've got huge cuts taking place in the public sector, which is going to increase unemployment, lower the amount of taxes that are paid. If you were betting, you would bet for a double-dip recession being very clearly what takes place in Britain in the coming period. So what's the solution? There is a solution. We put forward socialist ideas. What does that mean? It means, first of all, very basic starting point. We say to the rich, we're not paying for your crisis. We didn't cause this. You and your system caused this. The PCS, the Civil Servants Union, have worked out in Britain that there's £120 billion in unpaid taxes by the super rich in the main. If they were made to pay that up, it would, do, it would almost cover the amount uh, of uh, the national uh, deficit. But we'd go beyond that because let's be clear, how would you make those people pay? They won't pay their taxes. We have to have a mass campaign to demand that they do. But we also have to go further than that and say that wealth is not yours. We don't want to just have a few crumbs from the bakery, a few loaves of bread. We want to take over the bakery. We want to run society. <coughs> if you talk in Britain, the big companies, yes, the banking system, but going beyond that, the big multinational companies into public ownership, including, by the way, the capitalist media, we have to demand, this is an aside, on the question of the news of the world and all the rest of it, it's a sign of the mess they're in that the news of the world has had to fold. That's only one tiny bit of the Murdoch empire. And we have to demand a workers' inquiry, not organised by the police or the politicians. How are we going to trust them? A workers' and trade union inquiry to what's gone on with all the disgusting things that have taken place in the Murdoch press. But we would nationalise the capitalist media, not for it to be run in an undemocratic way, but to work it out fairly so that every strand of political opinion could have, you could work it out. You could say the percentage of the vote you get in the elections, you can have that much of the national press every day to write whatever you want. You work it out fairly, democratically, so different ideas got put across, not just those of the billionaires. But we would take the big companies into democratic public ownership and then we use the enormous wealth that exists in this country for the good, not of a few at the top, but for the majority of society. Capitalism didn't invest in industry, in manufacturing, because it wasn't profitable to do so. That's what capitalism is. It's a system where it doesn't matter that two billion people don't have enough to eat. If those people can't afford to buy food, there's no interest in producing food for those people to eat. It's all about profit. They're not interested in more teachers in more health workers, because there's no profit in for them. They're interested in privatising and selling off the public sector so they can make a fast buck out of us when we're ill or we need an education. But we would take things into democratic public ownership and immediately lower the retirement age, share out the work so that nobody had to work more than a 35-hour week, Nobody had to work till they were 68. We're not saying it would be compulsory. If you wanted to work longer, you could do so. But nobody had to. So instead of the ridiculous situation at the moment, where people are having to teach classes of 30 or 40 kids until they're 68, while young people are on the dole, you would organise it logically. So young people could run around after the kids, and older people could retire. All cats take on an easier teaching job. That's what they preferred. You would spend more on the public sector. You'd have a mass programme of public works. There is huge homelessness developing in this country. After the Second World War, <coughs> 230,000 council houses were built per year for six years by Labour and Tory governments. Why can't we put the building workers to work again to do the same today? So they're just some of the things that we would want to carry out. They're some basic socialist ideas. Now you can say that's utopian. You're never going to achieve that. But what we would say is that turning capitalism into a fair system is utopian. We're never going to achieve that. We can fight them, we can beat them, 
We can stop the attacks on pensions, but they're always going to come back to drive down our living conditions in a different way. And there is a whole generation now, worldwide, that are discovering if you stand up and fight, you can win. Once you've discovered that, the next stage is why not fight for a system, for a society that is run by us, by the majority, in our interests, instead of in the interests of a few bloodsuckers at the top.